Hello and welcome to the Suzanne Atwell Show. I'm Suzanne Atwell. In this edition, Unconditional Surrender, a uniquely Sarasota story. The city now owns the statue, but what next? Should we keep it? Where will it go? What does it represent? We begin with a short history and the real meaning of unconditional surrender. At the White House, President Truman, State Secretary Burns, and Cordell Hull stood by for the momentous surrender message from the Japanese. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. The Great War that began at Pearl Harbor in 1941, the heroic campaign across the Pacific, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. The Japanese lost the war they started, and America ended. It is impossible for us today to fully understand the scale of the conflict, the personal sacrifices that were made. Victory in Japan, the greatest day in the lives of the greatest generation. A spontaneous wave of jubilation swept the nation. Ticker tape parades, pandemonium, and patriotic euphoria literally an unconditional celebration. <laughs> Times Square, New York City, tens of thousands flood the streets. In the middle of it all, three unsuspecting strangers about to make history. Alfred Eisenstadt captured the cover photo for Life magazine. George Mendoza, a jubilant, intoxicated sailor, on leave, and scheduled to return to combat. And Greta Zimmer, a local gal who left work early and memorialized forever by Eisenstadt simply because the white uniform she wore at work made her look like a nurse. That was the moment in context that produced the photo that inspired a sculptor to create the statue that now graces our Bayfront. Which takes us to the next part of the story the artist and how his creation found its way to our shores. John Seward Johnson, known as Seward Johnson, is an American artist known for creating large life-size statues engaged in day-to-day -day activities. He is the founder of Grounds for Sculpture, a 42-acre park and museum located in New Jersey where his works are displayed. Unconditional Surrender is a series of several versions that began in 2005. In response to a copyright infringement claim by Life Magazine, Johnson has stated his sculpture is not based on the famous shot by Eisenstadt, but rather one in the public domain by a different photographer. Another Seward work called Forever Maryland was the object of controversy displayed in Stamford, Connecticut she appeared to be mooning the Congregational Church across the street. So our statue is not the only controversial Seward Johnson work. And to understand how the piece came to us, we turn to a man named Jack Curran. In 2005, the statue debuted in Sarasota as a temporary exhibit. It then moved to San Diego and then to New York City. In 2009, Curran, a World War II Navy vet and Sarasota resident, offered to pay half a million dollars if the city would display it for 10 years. There were legal copyright concerns and many opposed the idea, saying it was tacky. I was a commissioner at that time and voted against it. I had concerns about some technicalities and did not feel the Bayfront location was appropriate. Curran died in 2008 and is buried in the Sarasota National Cemetery. Last year in February, days after the death of George Mendoza, the statue was vandalized with a spray paint of hashtag Me Too. The work is considered by some to condone and celebrate a man 
forcing himself on an innocent victim. Which takes us to the present. This past June, the 10-year display agreement with Mr. Curran's estate came to an end. The city had several options. During the June 1st meeting, held via Skype, city commissioners listened to the city attorney's take on the matter. Commissioners did vote to authorize the Public Art Committee to look at best ways to move and store the statue. That is scheduled for October of this year to make way for the construction of the new roundabout at Gulfstream and 41. So where do we go from here? What does the process look like? And what are our options? For that, we turn to city manager, Tom Barwin. Well, hi, Suzanne, great to see you again. Uh, the city commission in June uh, accepted ownership of the statue unanimously by a five to zero vote. Mm -hmm. It was on loan to the city for the past decade and the city now uh, is in complete ownership and can uh, do what it chooses to do with it. And that includes uh, relocating it temporarily, uh, mm -hmm. storing it until a permanent location uh, is identified, giving it to somebody mm -hmm. or selling it. And as mm -hmm. you probably recall, uh, the original value of that statue was about a half a million dollars. Right. Uh, 10 years later, Literally millions of people have been photographed at mm -hmm. the statue here in downtown Sarasota. So I would project that the value of that statue now probably is at least a million dollars. So the value is gone up. It could be up. sold, I suspect, if, <laughs> yeah. you know, if that was the, the decision by the city. So <clears throat> when do you anticipate a decision on this? Uh, people are still wondering what's going on. You don't want too much time to go by. When do, you, do they have to make the decision? Um, and what will it entail? I know there's a lot of legal ramifications. So, Well, there's a series of decisions that have to be made for both unconditional surrender and complexus, the big tall red uh, yeah. sculpture, uh, very near unconditional mm -hmm. surrender. Mm -hmm. uh, they both have to be removed and relocated, at least temporarily, uh, really and permanently uh, somewhere, because the roundabout at Gulfstream in US 41 will be under construction uh, at the end of the season in 2021. Mm -hmm. So the current uh, projection is that we need to get on with moving the statues from their current location uh, sometime this fall, probably October 2020 in that mm -hmm. area, give or take a month. So there'll be a series of decisions. Uh, the mm -hmm. first one has been made, the city will retain ownership. Right. Uh, the next one is what to do with the statues temporarily. Mm -hmm. whether to put them in storage or whether to relocate them mm -hmm. somewhere, probably near, nearby. And then the process will be unfolding at the Public Art Commission in terms of what will be the potential permanent locations. And then, of course, we have to plan and finance all of these different moves. Uh, each statue would take about $25,000 just put into storage. And when we bring them back out, or if we relocate them temporarily, the new foundations <clears throat> are about 20,000 each because they have to be very solid, hurricane proof, mm -hmm. and uh, you know stand uh, 175 mile an hour winds if, if we get them, because it'll be probably four or 500 days before the Gulf Stream roundabout will be completed once mm -hmm. it begins. Uh, we have petitioned FDOT <clears throat> to put complexus in the new roundabout at oh. US 41 in Gulf Stream. The height requirements, uh, correct? The height is, uh, we have to get a waiver on the height okay. <clears throat> because the current height requirement is 25, 30 feet and I believe complexus is 50, 60 feet. Mm -hmm. But it's so pencil thin yes. at the top mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's such an iconic piece mm -hmm. and it's been there uh, almost 10 years as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like a natural. Mm -hmm. And we would save a good deal of, mm -hmm. of money uh, not having to recreate another sculpture for that site. But we'll see. We're talking with FDOT about that. So we may have two sculptures that, that need new homes. Uh, most of the public input we've gotten so far about unconditional surrender is that because it involves a Navy veteran, uh, it should be near water. Uh, the other one that's comparable to this is in San Diego, mm -hmm. and it's right on the uh, Navy property right, and very near mm -hmm. water, mm -hmm. uh, right on the edge of the bay over there. Mm. So uh, people have talked about the Lido Pavilion, they've talked about St. Armand's, they've talked about the new park, 
Uh, they've talked about, you know, at one of the entrances to O'Leary's or Marine and Jack's in terms of keeping it in, in the heart of the community uh, where it's been for the last 10 years. And to some people, it's almost become iconic yeah. already. Right. Uh, so, but like so many things, there are many different perspectives and views and uh, mm -hmm. in, in the fine traditions of Sarasota, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll consider all public input and hopefully, as usually happens, uh, we'll yeah. get a good decision at the end. Unconditional surrender is not without its detractors, some whom say it's sexual assault. <clears throat> mm -hmm. As city manager of the great city of Sarasota, even if the majority of people believe that, that this is not the case, doesn't public ownership and the display of, of work invite vandalism um, or create other divisive activity uh, over the next few months, certainly over the next four or five hundred days, mm -hmm. uh, the leaders, the people who actually make the final decision, which will be the city commission, sure. I think will glean a sense of where this community is at collectively overall. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of veterans who live here. We yeah. have a lot of veterans who visit here. Uh, we, you know, it, it's not necessarily high art mm -hmm. that uh, you know we, we value in this community, but it certainly is art that a whole lot of people can relate to and just seem to love mm -hmm. because it's the second most popular uh, visitor's attraction according to the Visitor's Bureau that we have right. here in the city. And you know, as you know from your role as former mayor and, and city commissioner, three, four million visitors a year come right. through Sarasota. Right. So all that has to be balanced. And uh, with that said, uh, this community uh, appreciates and values everybody's mm -hmm. perspective mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, a, a process of calibrating it in to come out with the best uh, decision. A lot of people feel that uh, what might help neutralize all this storm and drum going on with this is to contextualize it. Well, there's a lot more context, including the, the times we're living in and what we're going through right now and what we need to do in terms of economic recovery. So within the context of, you know, those inputting right now, uh, you know, it, it, it perhaps hopefully can be cited somewhere mm -hmm. uh, locally that uh, I think acknowledges all perspectives on this. So even with the issue that has been raised regarding unconditional surrender, I think it's quite possible that maybe the plaque could be adapted. Uh, it could be an opportunity to you know, further educate the public on its history. Mm -hmm. uh, we could perhaps even put up a picture of you know, the graffiti that was up mm -hmm. there uh, a few months ago and sort of explain that, you know, different people have different perceptions exactly. of this. Right. But, uh, right. you know, as a city manager, I am always doing a kind of a running poll and a running survey of, of what people think. And uh, I mm -hmm. ask a lot of people, uh, especially women, mm -hmm. what, what they think about the statue. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to say, you know, my own personal poll and survey is most of them are saying, yeah, I, I see why some people have an issue, but I'm okay with it. Tom makes a good point about artistic expression and culture in Sarasota. We also have a tradition here of articulate and outspoken opposition. Unconditional surrender is no exception. Our next guest, Kelly Franklin, exposes a dark side to the circumstances of the kiss and makes a compelling argument against the prominent display of the statue. I didn't know any of this history when I moved to Sarasota. I walked under a sculpture that hadn't been here before, and it was a sculpture. I can't say I paid much attention to it. Um, but I, I do some volunteer work, and I worked with a young person who had been sexually assaulted and she refused to walk anywhere near that statue because she said he was hurting her. I tried to explain that no, they were just kissing, but she knew something I didn't because she looked up and she saw the arch of the back and the off balance leg and the deep, deep bend that said, this is not a loving act. This is an act of violence. And it's the force of that today that I find so deeply troubling. But that's the message that we're sending, not about what happened 75 years ago, 
at a moment of excitement after a long and horrible war with a drunken man, mm -hmm. um, I can't change that. Nothing we can do can change that. And it's clearly a mixed bag. I mean, Greta herself had, I think as we all would, mixed feelings about this portrait. Here she is, part of history. It's an iconic photo. It's everybody's ideal of romantic love and reunion. And yet she knows what it is and that it was forced. The sailor, George Mendonca, had the same kinds of things. Kind of proud, because hey, if you're a man, this, this is a good look. Um, but also knew that he had drunkenly grabbed a woman he didn't know and forcibly engaged in sexual contact. So you, you mentioned so. a good look. So a bad, uh, would, would a, a better look be, what about a hug? But this was a better look than if he had just hugged. Would it have been so um, transformative if it had been a hug? It might not have spoken to us right, as much. Right. I mean, the artist was explicitly attempting to play with archetypes, Jungian archetypes. This was not his only work in this series. There are lots of other famous photographs that he copyright infringed and had printed um, on a big 3D printer, if you will, in another country. Yeah. Um, and he was trying to challenge our ideas about what an ideal is. But we've ended up with a fake kiss trying to reenact a Hollywood kiss that was, it's never real world, that was actually a forced kiss. And now what we end up with today, 75 years later, because of the size of this sculpture and its placement and its signage and everything about it, is a reenactment by consenting couples of a violent act of a fake idea of a romantic ideal. And this is where my deepest horrors from this come, um, is that we're mixing up these ideas about romance and consensual acts versus unilateral and violent acts. Isn't public art supposed to evoke very strong feelings about something? So would you um, call that a piece of wonderful public art because it invokes negative, different people, it invokes different things. Monuments are different things, right? Yeah. And there's lots of discussions about monuments and rethinking mm, what yeah. they represent and who wrote the history then and who's writing the history now and what purpose they serve. Right. I don't think this was ever created with such a nefarious intent of intimidation and um, as some of the Civil War monuments, for example, were explicitly put up as part of Jim Crow to reinforce something. This was more an accident of history um, the person that, that purchased this statue for Sarasota did so as a tribute to his wife who had loved the picture and loved the moment and it made her think of them and, and the end of the war and it was beautiful. It's a beautiful gesture from that perspective. That's a very romantic and wonderful story and we should tell that. But as it turns out, under the covers, the reality was far less attractive. It's not at all romantic. Um, it's unilateral, it's violent, it wasn't okay then, it's not okay now. My final question is, so now what? What should we do with a, with a statue? Now that, it, that it's going to come before policymakers and the lease is up, what do we do, Kelly? We can't rewrite history, and we kind of did for a long time. Um, and what we can't do is keep using this as a kissing post. I mean, to me, I've heard the arguments, this is popular, yes it is, so was the Roman Colosseum. We should not erect a new one by the Van Wezel and start feeding Christians to lions. I mean, some things you just can't do. They are morally wrong. And what we've ended up with here is morally wrong. What do we do with it? I, I, I don't know. I, I have great respect for those who fought and served. My grandfather was one of them. Two of his brothers died in that war. You know. I don't want to in any way take away from their sacrifice and their valor, but I don't think that this statue represents the best of the military. Um, I don't look at it as honoring service, so I'm not sure. It's been suggested that maybe the Sarasota National Cemetery might be a place. I have mixed feelings. My grandfather's in a place like that. I don't think this honors him, but if folks there are comfortable with it, I guess that's one solution. At least you would not have the same kind of tourist attraction emulation, which is the most disturbing part of this diorama to me, if it was in a setting that was more solemn.
Um, it could be in an art museum or it could be appropriately contextualized. We had an exhibit at the New Contemporary Art Museum from Ringling College last summer with five photographs from war, Iwo Jima being one of them, the girl running from Napalm, this one. When you can understand that this moment of sexual violence occurred in a specific moment in time, then A, you're less likely to emulate it unknowingly, which is the danger of it, and B, more likely to be understanding about it. So that might be an option. Um, but to me, I, I guess the best option, because we never intended to bring a statue of a Holocaust survivor being sexually assaulted as the centerpiece for our town, I think the move and the end of the donation agreement force us to reckon with, is this how we want to represent ourselves to the world? And I, my gut would be, no, I don't think we should and I don't think anybody else should because no matter where you display this, if it's displayed the way we've had it, you're going to have the same kind of reincarnation. Another suggestion Kelly had was for the city to donate the piece to the Grounds for Sculpture Museum in New Jersey, where many of Seward's other works are displayed. Our next guest is Dan Kennedy, an educator, a patriot, and a strong supporter of keeping the statue in Sarasota. To me, the, the unconditional surrender statue really brings together various generations. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was headmaster of the military academy, I would bring students down there and we would discuss World War II and the end of it and the jubilance that occurred when that, when we finally had victory over Japan. It helps them understand and bridge the gap between the two generations. So I think it's a valuable asset to be mm -hmm. retained by the city and mm -hmm. it should be placed uh, either back as close to where it is right now or someplace where there's ample parking and a, and a very public setting. Right. What do you think of, um, um, I think it was suggested at the city commission that maybe another municipality might want to take it during the interim if they would be responsible for moving it. Uh, that's not a bad idea as long as it's displayed and it's uh, recognized for what it is by other communities. That might not be a bad idea. Right. It's know. their choice where they yeah. put it, their commission. I, I've often thought about uh, maybe a temporary location would be inside the airport. Hmm. where we have people coming from all over the country and they can stop and see that and reflect on, on what it represents. Mm -hmm. So that um, leads me to question the, um, how do we contextualize that? If we did, say it went into an, the airport or some other enclosed place, that there would be like you go into a museum with a, controver a controversial sculpture, um, whatever, that it would be explained as to what it is. How far do we go with that? Well, I, I think that's an important point. I do think it's important that we explain the context of that particular sculpture. Uh, it was certainly developed by the, by the artist to represent mm -hmm. the mood of the, of, the, of the country at that particular point in time. Incidentally, that particular photo was one of the first photos that my father sat me down and explained to me the significance of that particular photo. I was born just after the end of World War II. Right. But he saved that photo, and when I was old enough to understand, we sat down and talked about it. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's probably been really important to me is that we retain that uh, important representative of the mood of the country. And Greta Zimmer, the young uh, <coughs> nurse or dental hygienist, yes. um, portrayed in the statue uh, we have heard that she said, this was not my choice. So uh, does it matter? I mean, we're, that's the controversy I think we're getting into. Is it more than a kiss? Um, and is it a commitment to all veterans? Well, yes, I think, you know, I recognize the sensitivities on both sides of the issue, obviously. And I think taken out of context of, the, of that particular day, it might prove to be offensive to some people. Mm -hmm. But when you think about what was happening that particular moment in time, the end of World War II. Right, right. Um, aside from the controversy, which we'll probably have, just looking at it for public relations for the city, what does it say about um, artistic and ethical values of our community? Do we need to go there? Well, that's certainly thought-provoking, but I think we do need to go there because Sarasota is all about the arts. And art is in the eye of the beholder. Some mm -hmm. people will probably find that garish and, and not appropriate for our city. Mm -hmm. Some people say it represents Sarasota's love for our veterans mm -hmm. and the support of our military and the support of our country in general. Mm -hmm. And to that, to them, that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of who is viewing the statue at, at what particular time. To me, it's beautiful. 
when you weigh both sides of this debate, um, could there be a compromise um, uh, contextually and perspective that addresses the concern of both sides? You hinted on that a little bit. <clears throat> what could we do? Well, I know there are people who don't care to have it on the bay front. And then there are some who really want to have it on the bayfront. Mm -hmm. So there could possibly be a compromise. I think, at least from my own point of view, I would be open to a compromise if it's moved to a local public place where people can go and see it and talk about it, mm -hmm. such as the airport. I don't think the, um, the cemetery is the appropriate spot. And finally, Dan, you mentioned that um, your father explained to you uh, what this picture, uh, this photograph uh, meant right. and explained it to you. Question, if you were going to explain this to your granddaughter, what would you say? Well, I think I may have gone through that exercise just the other day because I was walking with a female recent graduate from SMA and we, we discussed the, uh, the statue and its context. Mm -hmm. And I think it's all about the context. And, you know, today's young people are very intelligent. Yeah. They're very worldly. They're, they're not anything like you and I were when we were growing up, you know, kind of not aware of our surroundings and that type of thing. So, you know, uh, you explain the euphoria of the moment. Mm -hmm. You balance that with the fact that taken out of context, this would probably be an in, inappropriate act because it was an un, unwelcomed, unrequested kiss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you went down the street or you went to the beach and you ran down the beach and you saw someone and you grabbed him and kissed him, you'd probably end up in jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this was a euphoria of the moment that the biggest challenge our country has ever faced mm -hmm. prevailing in World War II. This represents that, mm -hmm. that victory, that moment in time when our country came out of the war. Right. And it's a moment that uh, people who were alive back then, mm -hmm. they still recall today how they felt, the thrill that went through their body to know that the war was over. As the process moves forward, it will be interesting to see what happens. I suspect location is going to be the biggest controversy, but ownership itself must be considered. When we look at the economic challenges in 2021, owning a million dollar piece of art is a luxury that could buy a lot of other stuff. If you would like to know more, go to cspan.org forward slash video and look for Newsreel Japanese Surrender. For more on the famous photo, go to Amazon and type in Kissing Sailor Mystery. The works and life of Seward Johnson, groundsforsculpture.org. And, of course, you can watch this episode and all our previous shows on our website, suzanneatwell.org, our Facebook, and YouTube pages. Well, that wraps up another one. Hope you enjoyed the show and learned something. Thanks for watching, and until next time, see you around town.